Back in December, I organised and hosted a debate on this channel with the intention of discussing some of the less explored evidence around the prescription retinoid tretinoin as an anti-aging treatment for our skin. To do that, I invited two contributors who I had previously interviewed on the channel and who had brought new and interesting perspectives. The first was Ivan Galenin, a veteran of the pharmaceuticals industry who received a scientific training while working for Sanofi and spent much of his career as a research and development strategist in pharmaceuticals. He's now the founder of a skincare company and devotes a lot of time to researching facial fat health. The second was Dr Chen Xu, a highly experienced British doctor who trains other physicians and returned to working on the front line of healthcare during the COVID pandemic and still supports in emergency care settings, but her primary occupation is aesthetic medicine, including prescribing tretinoin where appropriate for patients. With so much content out there focused on the benefits of using a prescription retinoid, and in particular the idea of using it at high strength, daily and on a long-term basis, as someone who was using tretinoin, I had questions about what the longer-term data actually shows, and so I invited Ivan and Dr Chien on so I could gather their insights from a pharmaceutical perspective and from a medical one. I'm a journalist of over 26 years' experience, and I checked that the statements made by both contributors were evidenced and a appropriately sourced. Yet the information shared and views expressed were very prominently called into question in a response video by high-profile YouTuber and dermatologist Dr Dre and others, and the contributors in my debate were accused of misinformation and being factually incorrect. This unleashed a considerable amount of online criticism of each of us involved. In fact, I still receive comments in which the clear assumption is that the information shared in the debate was false and deliberately misleading, rather than being a discussion of lesser heard but very real evidence that should be discussed, as was the debate's purpose. My initial response was simply to share the evidence used to support the statements made in the debate in the comments section of the video and to just move on. But it has become clear to me that it's simply unfair to deny Ivan and Dr Chen the right to reply and, crucially, to show you the data supporting the views expressed. And while I'm aware that returning to the debate exposes us all to further criticism, sometimes your conscience is not your convenience and I have a responsibility to the two professionals who I invited onto this channel in the first place to allow them to set the record straight. And I want to be clear that no one is saying it's a bad idea to use tretinoin. The idea is to share the longer term data to allow users to make informed choices about how much of it they use for anti-aging purposes and for how long to suit their own skin. So let's take a closer look at that evidence now. Thank you to you both for returning to the channel to respond to the criticism of our original uh, tretinoin debate. I only wish that we could have shown the data and I think that that would have probably um, answered a lot of the questions that people had afterwards. Dr Chen, I did want to start with you first because you opened the debate by flagging the anti-aging benefits of using tretinoin and vitamin A more generally on our skin and you said the question was um, not whether we should be using it, but uh, how much we use of it and for how long. Um, so you're not an advocate of using the prescription retinoid tretinoin long term, but rather you feel it can be beneficial for a period of time in addressing certain skin concerns, including wrinkles and of course acne, before moving on to gentler maintenance options. And there was heavy pushback from advocates of tretinoin on that protocol, why do you feel it's best used for a limited period? Thank you, Claire, for uh, giving us this opportunity to discuss these issues. And the reason we couldn't include everything in the last video is because this is a massive topic and we can't possibly include everything in a 25 minute video. Um, and also, I'd like to point out that my opinion is my opinion, and yeah. many other clinicians will have different opinions. It doesn't necessarily make me wrong or make me right or make them wrong or right. Um, it just shows that actually medicine and science, it, that like there are often no absolutes, there's, there's, there's no black and white. Based on my clinical experience um, and what I've learned about tretinoin over the years, my personal belief is that we shouldn't be using it long term because I do see in clinical practice that a lot of people have 
very um, reactive skin and they just, I mean, for practical reasons, they just can't tolerate the constant skin peeling, um, the skin irritations, the, the redness. They just, they can't handle those sort of downtime from tretinoin. So it makes sense that once they've had that initial treatment period, they've kind of got to the best result that they can from their um, from that treatment, to then step down to a more gentle uh, retinol where they can continue long term without all the downtime and just let the skin recover and heal a little bit. Um, so that, that's what I've been doing all these years and, and clients are happy. They're getting great results. Um, that's what I've done personally and I'm happy with my skin. Because you've used tretinoin yourself personally. Um, but, um, you know, we, we had quite a few people come back and say, oh, well, you're an emergency doctor, but you've been working in the aesthetic field. I mean, yes, you, you did return to the front line over COVID. Thank you very much for doing that. But how long have you been working in the field of aesthetic medicine and, and prescribing tretinoin? I've been doing aesthetics for just over 10 years and I've been um, working very closely with treating skin in particular and prescribing tretinoin for uh, just over eight years. So long mm -hmm. enough to have seen enough. Ivan, um, how does your background qualify you, do you think, to, to discuss tretinoin and its effect on the skin because a lot of people questioned your expertise and whether you have the right to comment on it in the first place. I was trained and worked as a research scientist for a major pharmaceutical company for eight years for, for Sanofi. And my job was really cool. So I was the scout for innovation in the field of inflammation. And in a company of 100,000 people, I was the only person who had that role and the only non-PhD. And so my, my job was to evaluate really early stage biology and drugs and technologies and really make the case to um, the most senior research and development people that we should acquire those technologies. And my typical evaluation would take three months, six months, nine months. And then I would recommend them personally to a group of 21 uh, top scientists. And presumably those evaluations were of scientific studies. So you are no stranger to poring over scientific studies and understanding them. Yeah. And in most cases, there were a lot, the evaluations were a lot more difficult because you have a lot less information. You mm -hmm. have maybe three or four animal studies. You don't have this wealth of clinical data. And then afterwards, after I left Sanofi, I joined Mount Sinai School of Medicine as the head of commercial development. And I ended up starting two companies with very uh, accomplished um, research scientists, mm -hmm. one in the field of genetic disease and one in the field of cancer. Okay. So then I got started in skincare mm -hmm. and um, I worked on three years uh, on my product for three years before I was willing to risk my reputation as a scientist for something that I knew people would think was gimmicky. I recruited uh, top plastic surgeons in the field to work with me. And I was published as the lead author in Europe's uh, top plastic surgery journal. But that's not really what qualifies me to help educate your community. What qualifies me the most is that I am incredibly insecure. So I always think that I'm, I don't know anything until I know <laughs> everything. And so when I approached Redne, I assumed I didn't know anything. So I, I, I didn't have any bias. I really wanted to learn everything from scratch. And I've been, I was told this was the gold standard. And if I was going to be in the field, I'd have to understand it. And so when I stumbled across findings that I had never heard discussed, I was like, hey, take a look at this. Isn't that interesting? And so that's, that's really how I got to the topic. And really, that's what makes me uh, an interesting uh, perspective on, yeah. on the field. Yep, yep, you certainly brought that. Um, and you opened your argument by highlighting that the FDA had only approved uh, Renovo for the mitigation of fine lines. Um, and in the critical response, it was stated that Renovo was approved in 1995 for the mitigation of fine lines plus mottled hyperpigmentation and rough texture associated with photo damage. So wider parameters 
than you had stated when you talked about Renova. Uh, now, this is an easier one to, to clear up because neither of you was wrong on that point. It's just that Renova, in its original formulation, was indeed approved for the mitigation of fine lines, mottled hyperpigmentation, and rough texture. But that formulation has been discontinued, and Renova, in its current 0 0.02 formulation, is only approved for the mitigation of fine lines. And that I double checked in writing with the FDA to ensure I had confirmation. Um, and yeah. that is indeed the sole indication. I think that the idea of what indication it's approved for and what it's not approved for is a little bit of a red herring. You know, we know, for example, that Retin-A works also for pigmentation. We know that it decreases the melanin content in the skin by 80%. So I'm, you know, I would be foolish to even imply, and that was not my intent, that it doesn't work for pigmentation. In fact, I mentioned at, at another point during our initial discussion that, you know, if you want to use Retin-A for melasma or hyperpigmentation for a short period of time, I didn't see anything that was wrong with that. So I just focused on, on tretinoin because it has the largest body of evidence. But because Renova has been approved for fine lines, you can prescribe other similar treatments for fine lines. Is that correct? Correct. Off-label, on-label or off-label, yeah. Okay. All right, it's just to make that clear for myself and the viewers as to you know why Renova was brought into it in the first place. Um, so you also reference a 10-point evaluation score used to secure the approval of Renova on the basis of a half-point improvement in fine lines, which was called into question in that critical response as having no obvious source. Where did you source that evaluation score from? From the FDA um, access database, which you, know, you need in order to get a drug approved, you have to have an endpoint, right? And, then, and, and so... You have to say, this is what I'm going to show. This is what I'm going to use to show that the drug works. And so in this case, the um, Johnson & Johnson said, we're going to use this 10-point scale, for example, to evaluate wrinkling. And if we show an improvement on that 10-point scale, please approve us. So this was the, this was the vehicle that they had selected as, as one of their endpoints. And you can have different, um, different criteria for evaluating the hyperpigmentation and the coarseness and, and the other um, parameters. But for wrinkling, they use this 10-point scale. Okay. Um, in making the point that Renovo is only approved as a wrinkle treatment and that the label specifically states it's, it, it doesn't repair sun-damaged skin, reverse photoaging, or restore more youthful or younger skin, did that not undermine the benefits? I mean, you've mentioned them, you know, hyperpigmentation, for example, did, did it not undermine the other benefits that have been documented in studies of tretinoin, you know, showing its benefits for improving um, pigmentation and also for things like collagen synthesis? And, and do we need to, therefore, differentiate between the early stage changes with tretinoin use in the first, you know, six to 12 months, what we see then, as opposed to the longer term data? Absolutely. So there are a couple of points there. So first of all, I think it's very telling. If you look at the label, right, the label for the drug is so important. It's, you know, it's heavily, heavily negotiated. And so you have the sponsor, Johnson & Johnson, and and their academic advocates trying to make the label as attractive as possible. And then you have, in this case, the FDA saying, well, wait a minute, you didn't really show this and you didn't really show that. So because the FDA is concerned by exactly what you said is although they did show, right, with the 0.2% uh, reduction on, on fine lines, and it was clear and significant that it would be then used for everything and for like anti-aging in general. And that's why the FDA put in the language that they did. They didn't have to say that, right? They didn't have to say it doesn't work to reverse aging. It's not going to, it's not going to reverse uh, uh, photo damage, but they did because they were worried about that because what happens in their experience is that once drugs get on the market, right? 
the magazines write about them, they're talked about them, and they're, you know, they're blown up, which is in fact exactly what's happened with Retin-A. So exactly what the, what the FDA feared would happen has happened. And so it's described as the gold standard for anti-aging. I just want to um, make a comment about the, the labeling of, of drugs. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of doctors use some use some medications off license or off label um and it's not to say that it's necessarily wrong it may not be recommended by the um by fda or um whichever country um you're in which you know the, the organization that approves the the use of that drug um so there is this kind of gray area where a drug may not be licensed to treat a certain indication yet um mm -hmm. but it's being used off license off label to treat those things by clinicians who have experience using them. And that's not illegal and is not necessarily wrong. Mm -hmm. And it can be the right thing to do for some people. So I think this is where there's a lot of confusion with, mm -hmm. with people. On the one hand, you've got it clearly written on the label saying this, um, you know, Retin-A doesn't lead to this. And on the other hand, you've got clinicians prescribing it and say, well, well, I'm seeing good results with my patients, with my clients. Um, so there is this conflict. And I think the reason we're having this debate in the first place is that at the end of the day, no one really has the right answer. And the reason we're here is to have this debate, is to have this discussion, to bring up both sides of the arguments. And then you know, so people can actually make up their own minds. We are not telling people what to do. I couldn't agree. I couldn't agree more. The last thing I want to do is to tell people what to do because everyone else is telling people what to do. I want to just share data with people so that um, they can think about these things for themselves. Dr. Chen, what was your intention? Well, I mean, the same, you know, I'm, I'm a sort of Western trained doctor. I'm um, a scientist in my approach uh, to medicine, um, wanting to practice evidence-based medicine. And I take that same approach into doing aesthetics. And, you know, I wouldn't use a new product without knowing for sure that it's had that safety profile well tested, um, that I'm not causing my clients any harm by, by giving them a certain treatment. Um, and with tretinoin or retinol, it, you know, they've been used for a long, long, long time. The results from it have been mixed. Um, it has been, you know, some people swear by, by it. And so they get really defensive when you say, oh, you know, there's evidence showing that, you know, it has all the, the, the downsides to it. We're not trying to personally attack them and say what you're doing is wrong. It's mm. just there are evidence suggesting this and it, it may not be the right thing for everyone. Mm. So, you know, the reason that I've decided to join in this debate it is not to say that what I'm doing is absolutely right. I'm actually interested to hear the other viewpoint to because it, you know, it, it's not interesting debate if everyone agrees with each other. And no. that's not how science works. And I was asking myself, you know, at 10 months of using tretinoin, is it a good idea to keep going with this every day for the rest of my life? I have to make this decision now. What am I doing with this? What am I going to get out of it? When I started to look at that, when you Google tretinoin and you look at all the articles about it, it's like there's no downside. No downside other than a bit of irritation. Um, and I think that, that, that we are right to question that um, because otherwise, where is the roundness of information? Um, and why is there not a roundness of information around this? So we're gonna look now, um, you know, we're gonna come to that issue of dermal thickness, which um, caused uh, so, so much of a, of a debate in response to our debate. Um, you said that the evidence shows dermal thickness is reduced with long-term use of tretinoin. And um, in the critical response, it was claimed that, um, that the paper shows papillary dermal thickness increases slightly from 12 months to four years. And yet you had said it decreased. Can you talk us through why? Sure. So first of all, let's look at this paper, right? It's a... Uh histologic evaluation of long-term effects of tretinoin on photodamaged skin. And if we look at the authors, it's um, they're from Boston University, Duke University, and the R.W. Johnson Pharmaceutical Research Institute. So this is a paper written by, in part, by the sponsors of Renova. 
So that's important to keep in mind. Usually when you've, when you've done a study, your most important results go into the abstract. Now, in this case, they don't mention the reduction in um, dermal, papillary dermal thickness at all in the abstract. It's not one of the keywords. So you see tretinoin, photoaging, elastomucin, melanin, there's no reference to the uh, significant reduction in papillary dermal thickness. So you have to go to the results section, which is, and you have to go to the bottom to the dermal changes. And the only statement that you have here is at the end where they say, um, papillary dermal thickness increased slightly between 12 months and four years. Mm -hmm. So you think, oh, uh, papillary dermal thickness, it in increased. Uh, and this is what caught the dermatologist from YouTube. She read that, she's like, you know, what are they, what are those crazy uh, people talking about? It, it increased. Well, mm -hmm. it didn't. So if you actually look at the table you, and you see papillary dermal thickness from baseline to 12 months, it went down by 77%. Mm -hmm. From baseline to four years, it went down by 65%. When I saw this for the first time, this is what started me on my journey of questioning everything about Retin-A. And I thought, and I'd never seen a paper where you have such significant results and you don't discuss them in the conclusion, in the discussion, and you don't mention them in the abstract. They don't show that, that this change from 77 to 65 was statistically significant. And just explain for me and viewers the difference between in those skin layers, if we can go back up, because there'll be a lot of viewers yeah. looking at that, thinking what, what's papillary, papillary, papillary dermal thickness, epidermal thickness, granular layer thickness, what are we looking at there? Okay, so so epidermal thickness is the thickness of the epidermis, right? That's pretty straightforward. Granular layer thickness, that's a component of the epidermis, the, the granular layers. Papillary dermal thickness is uh, conventionally, the dermis is divided into two parts, a papillary um, dermis and a reticular dermis. And the papillary is the smaller part of it. It's maybe 20, 25% of the overall dermis. So you have the epidermis, which is about 0.1 millimeter thick. Mm -hmm. And then you have the, the dermis, which is about one millimeter thick. And the, the, the papillary part of it is, you know, 0. 0.2 millimeters or so. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't kill me if I'm wrong a little bit there. But it's the it's the smaller it's the considerably smaller portion of the dermis. But papillary small... dermis is where the skin most of the skin the active skin cells are right where they live, um, where your stem cells are and the you know it's near the basement membrane where most of the cell activities happen right it's new, where the new cells are generated, and they gradually move up more superficially as as the cells become older. Um, and then gradually towards the epiderm uh, the um, epidermis is where the cells then become more flatter, more waxy. They lose their um, the nucleus. They, they gradually die, and then they become the dead layers of the the waxy layer of the skin, and then they're shed off. We can't just dismiss that papillary. I mean, I'm going to say thinning. Somebody's probably going to put me in like America's Most Wanted somewhere for saying that. But I mean, how else do you translate that? <laughs> No, just say it as it is, a reduction in papillary dermal thickness. So yeah. that's what it is. So here's two other points I want to make here is that we're not talking about the stratum cornea, right? So one of your dermatologist uh, uh, guests said, well, maybe they're talking about a reduction in the compaction of the stratum corneum. No, the stratum corneum is a part of the epidermis, and this is not what we're talking about. So th the other thing is that the 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 dermatologist from YouTube emphasized this, this aspect, which is that the elastic tissue also decreased after four years. And uh, it, they, they implied that, um, that this was elastosis. So this was degenerative elastic tissue that had been, um, that had been removed um, as a result of using uh, Retin-A. Now, they didn't actually do an evaluation 
of uh, the elastosis. That requires like a qualitative judgment. So when a pathologist looks at the um, uh, elastin and says, okay, this is dysregulated uh, on a scale of one to five or whatever scale they want to use, and this is less dys dysregulated. So here, there was no evaluation of the elastosis. They just looked at, okay, how much elastin was there? right? And they found a reduction. So we cannot say here, right, that the uh, reduction was good. We can't. It could be good. It could not be good. All we know is that the elastic tissue content was decreased. If I'm reading this correctly, though, if there's a reduction in the elastic tissue, surely that's a bad thing because we want more elastin in the skin. Elastin is not the same as elastosis. Elastic tissue is just a generic. They said, look, there's less of it, right? And it could be, right? It could be clearance of the elastotic degenerative tissue, right? It could be, in which case you could, you would say, yeah, that's a good thing. But in this case, we don't know. All we know is that whatever antibody they used to stain for elastin, right, showed less elastin. And that's it. We didn't have a, a, a pathologist assess the, the quality of the elastin, which you can do. So this is a small study, 27 subjects. So now let's go to the, to the big study. And 27 subjects, it's not a lot of subjects. So, you know, a few people having irregular results can, can throw it, right? Because if you have just a few people that have throw off the results, it, it, it actually, the, var the variance is so big right, that yeah. you can't achieve statistical significance. That's mm -hmm. why in that study, they didn't show an effect on reduction in the epidermal thickness. There was an 11% numerical reduction, but it wasn't statistically significant because there was so much variation that they couldn't draw that conclusion. Now, here's a much bigger study. It's a better study, but before we say how good it was, it's still by the Redne academic groups, sponsored and participated by Johnson & Johnson. Okay. So this is again, a sponsored study. Mm -hmm. And so we go to the histological changes. They had you know, much larger numbers of, of subjects who were evaluated here. Um, they're not telling me exactly how many, but it was, you know, it was drawing from a group of 100, 130 subjects. And here's the thing, they looked at two time points 24 weeks and 48 weeks, and they looked at two strengths, the 0.1% and the 0.5%. And so you have, you can see the changes as a function of time and the changes as a function of the strength of the, of the drug. So this gives us uh, a little bit more insight than um, the other study where, where we couldn't really assess um, the, the dose effect. So here, if you look at Papillary dermal thickness, right? Mm -hmm. You see um, with the 1%, point, 0.1% group, there was a 13% reduction at 48 weeks, not statistically significant. And that reduction increased to 18% with the 0.5% group, and that was statistically significant. Just, just correcting a slight uh, mistake that I think you've just accidentally said 0 0.1 when it's 0 0.01. Yes, um, yes, I always make that mistake. Yeah, <laughs> zero, zero point zero one. That, that's right. So they looked at zero point zero one and zero point zero five, and you see a dose effect. So you see that the higher dose actually gives you a statistically significant thinning of the papillary dermis, whereas the lower dose, it's a numerical uh, reduction, but it's not statistically significant. And you see also an increase with time over time. So the at at 28, 24 weeks, it was a 9% numerical reduction, not statistically significant. At 48 weeks, it's an 18% numerical redu uh, reduction, which is statistically significant. So you see the effects of time and the effect of strength, and they're all pointing the same way. Now, here's the other thing. If you look at the reduction in the epidermal thickness, right, you see that now, because this is a larger group of subjects, it's smaller, 6% versus 11% in the previous study, but now it's statistically significant. You can actually say that the epidermal thickness also declines 
is this study comparable to the other study? Well, well, yes. If you look at the compact stratum corneum, the percentage of subjects who attain this, it's about 50%, which was, which was about 50% in the previous study. If you look at the melanin content reduction, you see an 80% reduction in the melanin content, which is exactly what we saw in the previous study. So this is telling me, okay, these studies are comparable, right? You're seeing the same things, right? Mm -hmm. And they're validating. They're validating of, of, of one another. And then we have this elastic tissue content. Again, they're not calling it um, elastosis, they're calling it elastic tissue content, and we see a, a 20% 20, 20 uh, decline. Dr. Chen, can I just check, what are you making of this so far? I mean, I, I mean, the, the numbers are numbers, and if it's, mm -hmm. you know, if it's a study that's um, set up appropriately, and it's showing statistical significance, then, you know, then that's significant. I guess what I'm wondering is, these are what the numbers show, but so what as in what does this actually mean yeah. in clinical practice you know the skin the the thinning of the papillary dermis what does that actually mean in clinical significant in in the clinical environment is that a good thing is that a bad thing is it a transient thing and here's the thing the authors don't ask that question that's the obvious question to ask is what what do we think about this reduction in papillary dermal thickness what do we think in this 80% reduction in melanin content. Is that a good thing? Do we want the melanin content to be reduced by 80%? Do we want the papillary dermal thickness to be reduced by 18%? That's the question that the authors don't ask. And that is deeply uh, surprising. Let's just say that. Uh, talking to, to dermatologists who are more positive about um, tretinoin, they say that what they see in practice um, with uh, users who've used it over the years and continue to use it, because many will fall away, but for those who keep using it, that um, you know they're not seeing anything concerning or else surely that would have been flagged by now. We've had so many users. And this is where the bias in the, in the, in the research comes. It takes money to do studies. And so there's no money in um, in re to, to to fund independent research. So if 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 you're an independent researcher and you you go to your university that's that's trying to decide, okay, do I give money to the cancer researcher or do I give money to you who's researching cosmetic drug? And you say, I, you know, I want to I want to investigate, you know, the the effect of papillary dermal thickness. You're not going to get it, you know. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why there's a paucity of independent research in the field. Well, yeah, generally across across skin care, you know, the, the amount of times that I've talked with people about, um, you know, radio frequency and, and and all these really quite powerful treatments, and we, we just don't have the independent research on them. I was accused of cherry picking the data, right? I was like, I, okay, this guy just picked the studies that were... Um, well, that you came in with an agenda. That supported my point of view. And so, you know, the some of the um, more constructive commenters, if I might say, actually made me aware of a study that I didn't, I wasn't aware of. Mm -hmm. And this was a study from 2005 when they were trying to address this point about papillary dermal thickness. And so they did this study and it's an open label study. Um, and what they showed was that a small portion of the of the papillary dermis uh, seemed to thicken. And this was not the entire papillary dermis, but about 10% of it, which, which they called the dermal repair zone or the DZR. And dermal repair zone is not a, it's, it's, it's not a well-defined geography in the skin. It's really like a made-believe uh, geography. And they looked at this little, little layer this like right here, you can see it. They looked at this bit and they said it doubled. First of all, this study has never been replicated, right? So we 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 don't know whether it's whether it's uh, the results uh, can can be replicated. Second of all, it's looking at ten percent of the papillary dermis, and the question I have is why didn't they report about the 
uh, entire papillary dermis. Like why 10%. did they? Why, why did they just report this finding? And all. And the other thing is, it's not clear. I mean, the 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 paper is worded in a way that it you're left guessing. But it's not clear that this evaluation was done in a blinded fashion. So I didn't want to be accused of ignoring this paper. But um, the you know three problems: uh, open label, unclear whether it's blinded unclear what other parameters they measured and, and didn't report and sponsored by Johnson & Johnson. And that was over a 22 month period, am I seeing at the top there? This was a long period of time. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so this was not the transient period, but really the key is how come the study, if it's so important, how come it hasn't been replicated? So then you ask the question, okay, if it reduces the size of the upper dermis, what about this idea that Redne increases collagen? right? Mm -hmm. Everyone everyone tells us retin-A increases collagen. And you said there was no evidence. Well, I, I, I exaggerated. There's no good evidence. There's there's lots of bad evidence. And what do I mean by that? So this, this is the paper that is the largest biopsy study of retin-A effect on collagen. So the, the paper that the YouTube dermatologist brought up looked at six subjects on their forearm skin using the product for four months. Okay. So irrelevant, completely irrelevant, because it, it's looking at it's looking at a time period where the skin is just adapting to uh -huh. the retin-A. And that uh -huh. period of adaptation lasts approximately a year. So these guys, they're gonna show us that collagen increases with the use of, of retin-A. Uh, this, this is the summary of their results. And so how much did collagen increase? Well, in only one measure, face and buttocks, uh, one year, two years, was it statistically significant. And that was after one year, they had a 4.77 increase in pro-collagen staining. Mm -hmm. Now, why do I emphasize pro-collagen staining? Because pro-collagen is the, is the molecule that's then converted into collagen, right? And staining is you use an antibody that lights up when it hits um, its target molecule, in this case, pro-collagen, and you measure how much of that, of that stain you see. So it's, it's, very, it's, it's very inexact, right? Because you're measuring the, the antibody could be binding to something else, but it's, you know, it's a useful tool. So at, four, at, at one year in the face, there was a 4.77 increase in one type of stain looking at pro-collagen and a 111% increase in another stain. But this, was, this wasn't statistically significant because the variability was so great, they couldn't achieve statistical significance even with a 111% increase. So that's at one year. When you look at it at two years, stain one, there's a uh, non-significant decrease in collagen and a, and a non-significant increase of 0.09%. Of this was the largest study, hundreds of subjects, hundreds of subjects, no increase in collagen from using um, Retin-A long-term. And are you ignoring other studies out there? Are there other longer term studies that show something different? Of course not. And this was actually a study that was cited by, by, uh, by the YouTube dermatologist. And it shows unequivocally that um, use of Retin-A long term does not increase collagen. Okay, here's another important thing. Remember we talked about the difference between elastin and elastosis? How elastin is just the amount of elastin in the skin and how elastosis is whether that elastin is dysregulated or not. Mm -hmm. Well, this study actually had a, a group of blinded uh, dermal pathologists evaluate this question. And they looked at tretinoin versus placebo and look at the number of subjects, 101 in both groups. So this is a gigantic study compared to all the other ones. And they found that there was no change in dermal elastosis between using Retin-A and not using Retin-A. So the percentage of subjects who, who uh, improved or didn't improve or got worse 
was 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 no different. So uh, the YouTube dermatologist said in her rebuttal that the Bawan paper showed a reduction in elastosis, and that's a good thing. Well, it didn't, and um, that elast that reduction in elastosis has not been validated by a larger study. But somebody else, and I, but I recognize it could be a shorter term study. You know, could be could bring in contradictory evidence around the collagen in particular. Has that one really been put to rest? Yes, there was a New England Journal of Medicine paper that showed that Red A increased collagen by eighty percent. New England Journal of Medicine collagen increased eighty percent. Wonder drug, right? That study looked at I forget whether four months, six months, eight months has never been replicated, and because. What that study was measuring was the skin's adaptation to Retin-A. Of course, you're going to see collagen changes. Initially, there's a tremendous increase in hyperplasia of the epidermis that then dramatically, after a year, declines, right? You're seeing major structural changes in the skin. If you didn't see collagen changes during that period, that would be a miracle. Of course, you saw collagen changes. But once the skin adapts, right, once the skin adapts, once this period of adaptation ends, there are no papers that show large studies, objective, blinded observation, all the things that we associate with good studies. Dr. Chen, what are your thoughts? The evidence shows what it shows, but how do we apply that in, in clinical practice? It doesn't necessarily mean that everything we're recommending is wrong. But it, it, I think we just need to be, as healthcare professionals or as, as skincare professionals, we just need to be more aware of both sides of the argument and giving people more um, balanced advice um, and, and what is right for someone else that they're getting good results is not necessarily right for everyone. You know, you, you had suggested that you felt the, the best results were seen over a limited period of time with tretinoin. And that's why you suggested that people, you know, used it for six months or so, moved on, you know, step back from it from there. And actually, there are quite a lot of benefits we're seeing, like the collagen synthesis in those early stages. From what Ivan has talked us through, it's the long term data that is way more questionable um, and when we don't have the answers for. I think that's as much as we can say. Yeah, I think that's fair. It's um, like most things in life. You know, I have this philosophy of you, you can't go at 100 miles per hour all the time. If you think about how you work, how you exercise, you cannot maintain that pace for the rest of your life. And it's the same thing that we're, we're putting our skin through. You know, you can't expect to stimulate it constantly for months and years on end with no downsides. That's just not But possible. some people run mini marathons every day until their 70s and it works for them and they're not the majority and some people um i just spoke to a dermatologist who reckoned 10 percent of her clients 10 percent are the ones that can use it long term and it works for them long term the rest not and if it works for them it works for them but it doesn't work for a lot of people and then this is my point and and that's really the point of of of, of having this discussion which is not to trash retin a right? It's not to say a retin-A stinks, right? It's to stimulate a discussion and say, okay, what does it do for whom? Under what circumstances? So, um, considering, Ivan, the research that you do around facial fat health, um, I asked whether you had any concerns about tretinoin affecting facial fat. Um, and I have, like you, seen a lot of people uh, reporting on forums fat loss that they say is connected to tretinoin and um, that they've got no answers for. Um, and so that was really primarily why I asked you the question. Well, I have to admit that this is not my finest moment because I was I was trying to have my cake and eat it too, right? I was trying to um, tell people, yes, you know, theoretically, retin A is anti dipogenic but don't worry about it. And the reason I did that was self-serving, right? Because I don't want to scare people about retin A, and I don't, because then people think that I'm a charlatan 
con men and all the other things that people called me when we did the um, first interview. So I was very cautious. I said, yes, yes, in vitro, it's antidepogenic, but we don't really know. So if you rub it in, maybe it won't go down the hair follicles. I am, I am now uh, prepared to be, to be less cowardly. And um, so I, I've, I've spent some more time looking at this and really uh, we're gonna see something really unusual, which we haven't seen. Um, and that's independent research, unsponsored research uh, with Redne. And this has convinced me to actually say, you know what, it's, uh, it is anti-adipogenic in normal use and we should watch out for it. And here's the, here's the study. So this is that rare thing, which is um, Redne research from a top academic uh, uh, center that's not sponsored by Johnson & Johnson. So this is really a top group, University of California, San Diego, um, and uh, UCLA, and um, University of Michigan. Before we get to this, so um, the dermatologist from YouTube dismissed my cowardly comments about Redne being anti-dipogenic, saying, oh, it's just in vitro data. You know, a lot of times, I think these were her exact words. A lot of times when we see stuff in a dish, it doesn't happen in a whole animal and it doesn't happen in humans. Mm -hmm. So let's think about those two things, whole animals and humans. So this is the second paper from this group about this mechanism. And let me just describe it for you. The dermal fat cells have an antimicrobial uh, mechanism. They, they secrete um, peptides that are antimicrobial. Um, and in the, in the previous studies were done in the, in the case of Staph aureus, that the fat cells can make this peptide that will, will uh, prevent colonization with Staph aureus. And now this group has found that the dermal fat cells actually make um, a, a peptide to prevent colonization with uh, C. acne, which is the bacterial species that is, doesn't cause all acne, but is involved with acne formation in some cases, just to be clear. Now, it's actually interesting how that works. So the, um, the pre-adipocytes are the cells along the hair follicle that can become either fibroblasts and make collagen, or they can become fat cells, um, mature fat cells. So these are actually uh, the key cells and they're, they, they call them the potential role of adipogenesis by dermal fibroblasts in acne. So these are fibroblasts that can convert into fat cells through a process called adipogenesis. And so um, it's actually this conversion of pre-adipocytes into adipocytes that causes this antibacterial peptide to be made. We know, right, from what I said before, that um, um, Redne uh, prevents this conversion of pre-adipocytes to adipocytes. Now, it turns out that if you prevent that conversion, you keep the uh, pre-adipocytes making that um, antibacterial peptide. So otherwise, right, if you have the, if you have the pre-adipocytes, while they're converting, they'll make the peptide. And then once they've converted, they stop making the peptide. So if you can somehow stop them from converting, they'll keep making lots of this peptide. And that's in fact what, retin what they showed Retin-A does. So it keeps these pre-adipocytes from converting to mature adipocytes. They make the peptide and they prevent um, um, C acnes uh, from forming. And here's the thing, if you, if, if you do this, right, in mice that can't uh, make the peptide, right, knockout mice that can't make the peptide, mm -hmm. Retin-A doesn't work to prevent the formation of acne in the mice. So that's, that's the whole animal bit, right? So now it's not just a Petri dish. Mm -hmm. It's actually in an in vivo setting where the Redne is applied in the same way it's applied in human beings mm -hmm. onto, onto the skin. And the other thing that they showed was that, and here's the statement, 
Analysis of inflamed skin of acne patients after retinoid treatment also showed enhanced induction of cathelicidin, a previously unknown beneficial effect of retinoids in difficult to treat acne. So cathelicidin is that uh, antibacterial peptide that's made by the pre-adipocytes that can't convert into adipocytes. So now we have some human evidence, indirect, that this mechanism by which Retin-A is actually effective in the treatment of acne is also tied to its anti-adipogenic effect. This is not a lot of data. And this is topically applied. Topically to applied in, in mice, right? And uh, data from human beings, right, who were treated with Retin-A, who have enhanced induction of this antibacterial peptide made by preadipocytes. So we're still connecting the dots. Now we have the dots that go from the Petri dish to the whole animal model to the human. What we lack, right, what we lack is, uh, you know, um, a human clinical study that shows that application of Retin-A for prolonged periods prevents the conversion of preadipocytes to adipocytes in a significant enough way to reduce the dermal fat. Uh, it's a difficult one. When you get into extracting something and, and then trying to give it meaning to people. I go back to the, quest, the question that I asked earlier, is looking at this evidence, is, is so what? What does this mean actually in clinical practice? Um, those people on the forums talking about um, loss of facial fat, volume loss, I imagine they are talking about the more deeper layers of fat loss rather than dermal fat cells, which is what you were referring to in this study. So those adipocytes, those fat cells in the hair follicles are in the dermis, in the in the in the skin essentially. But Correct. the dramatic volume loss that people notice are actually from the hypoderm below the dermis, the, the fat pads in the face, right? And there's probably a combination of fat loss from different layers of the skin and under the skin that happens with aging. Um, from that paper in particular, it's talking about the retin-A um, preventing the pre-adipocytes in the hair follicles from becoming adipocytes, but it doesn't talk about it destroying fat cells which exactly. there's a difference that's, isn't there absolutely that's 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 exactly that's exactly that's exactly right so you you're you're blocking the conversion of new adipocytes which can actually have a pretty dramatic effect on appearance but this is an area that, that more studies are required right and when you don't have any studies the correct thing to say is we don't have any studies that demonstrate this and that's what that's what I'm saying. Well, that that can of worms was was opened in the first debate and has now been splashed around, <laughs> and some worms have been thrown around the room. This is good. This is good. We need discussion. We need respectful, constructive discussion. You know, considering the reaction to the first debate, which is because largely because people don't, you know, we, we don't hear any negatives about retinol. And I mean, there we have this prescription retinoid that people use for years and years and years. And, and, and if we just didn't question it, we would just think, well, it's all absolutely marvellous and there's absolutely no reason to think twice about it whatsoever. But I mean, at the same time, um, people do use it successfully for years and years. So, I mean, where, where do you think we are at the end of all this? <laughs> conversation you know honestly i think if it wasn't for the power of social media this it, this wouldn't have become such a big thing mm -hmm. just to, to give you some context you know i've i've often sat in um meetings at the hospital between various different specialties and different different experts in, in the same field mm. having these arguments not not arguments discussions about treatment plans for various patients it could be cancer treatments you know what is the best way forward and so these kind of discussions actually happen even between different experts in the same field and people have different opinions mm -hmm. about what is the right treatment. So this is not unusual for a, a, a one dermatologist, one dermatologist to di um, disagree with another one. You know, everyone has had 
a lot of experience, different experiences, treating different patients, different clients, um, may perhaps having different results. So the fact that it has kind of blown up, <laughs> been blown up into um, out of proportion and has gained that sort of um, attention, I think in a way is not a bad thing. I think, as Ivan said, we we um, we are here to initiate a debate and to get people talking and to get them thinking critically mm -hmm. about what it is they are putting on their faces and what are the results that they are they are expecting what's the evidence behind it so I don't think people should look at this and say they're giving misinformation because we are providing the information that's out there in the in the public domain we are not making things up <laughs> can can we just say this this Ivan though to people watching because they uh you know pe people will walk away and think what does this mean for me and, and and Dr Chen I'm sure you'd agree with this that if their skin you know if they have been using this for years if, if you're seeing good clear bright healthy hydrated skin you don't have to panic about very much exactly right um you're your skin does tell the story. And if your skin is not happy with Retin-A, you will know about it. So that, that's the bottom line. Thank you to you both. <laughs>